Thank you, Stephen. What a blessing he is in this church. Can we give him a thank you? <laughs> Welcome again to our service. We have friends watching from Truesdale. We have a member or two at Peninsula Hospital this morning. We are praying for you today and wherever you are worshiping from today. We're starting a new series on hope if you haven't figured it out. For the next five weeks, we're going to talk about hope. And I can't wait to talk about that, especially also because of a a certain basketball game this afternoon. We we should really be hoping a lot more. I want to tell you about something exciting that happened in our church before we look at the topic of hope. Um, Last Wednesday, we had a preschool art and science show. It was fabulous. And so many young families were here. I was here with Ewan, a graduate, a distinguished alumnus of our preschool program. And uh, we can just be proud of of our preschool program. It is just fabulous under the leadership of Julie and all the teachers. So we throw the word hope around a lot. You probably already used it a lot today. I hope you're well. Um, Oh, I hope you're well too. I hope so. It's a throwaway word, but it shouldn't be because it is a bedrock of our theology. It's a Christian word, hope. Uh, You can help me with the most famous sentence in the Bible about hope. Paul talks about it at the end of Corinthians. And these three things remain, help me out, faith, hope, and love. What Paul is saying is that at the end of the universe, when the lights go out, when the last star is distinguished, there will be three things left. There will be faith, there will be hope, and there will be love. So we should get better about this theology of hope. So as we start this series, and again, we'll talk about hope for five weeks, I want you to think of something you hope for right now. Maybe it's simple, like the basketball game, or maybe it is a medical diagnosis you hope gets turned around, or maybe it's a relationship that you hope comes back, or maybe it's something to do with your kids, but I want you to have in your mind what you're hoping for today. Let's give that to God And then let's talk about hope. God, I thank you so much that you came into this world and you brought so much. You were the greatest teacher, the greatest philosopher, the greatest healer. You died and you came back to life again and you brought hope. Wherever you walked were flowers. And Lord, as we think about hope today, I pray that everyone here today would have a deeper sense and a feeling and an imbuing of your hope in our lives, wherever we're coming from. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. No more talk of darkness, forget these wide-eyed fears. I'm here, nothing can harm you, my words will warm and calm you. Let me be your freedom, let daylight dry your tears. I'm here with you, beside you, to guard you and to guide you. All I ask is every waking moment, turn my head with talk of summertime. Say you'll need me with you here and always. Promise me that all you say is true. Christine, That's all I ask of you. Close your eyes and surrender to your brightest dreams. Put your thoughts of the life you knew before. Close your eyes, let your spirit start to soar. And you'll live as you never lived before. Phantom of the Opera, it closed this last week after 37 years on Broadway. One of the greatest shows ever, although it can't be said that Phantom is the most hopeful of shows. It is about a ghost, after all, taking over a theater. But as you see from those lyrics, there is so much hope in that song and in so many of the Broadway shows. I mean, whether it's Annie or Oklahoma or Rent or Les Mis, you can't have a Broadway show without hope. People need to leave feeling more hopeful than when they came. But here's the question, is hope really a good thing or not? I mean, is it? 
Is it a good thing? And this question has been debated for centuries by philosophers. Hesiod in the 7th century BC, you may remember him, he wrote that great myth about Zeus who gives Pandora her box. And you remember <clears throat> Pandora has all of these curses. Zeus was angry with the world. And all these curses escape from Pandora's box, except for one thing, hope. So from that time on, philosophers have debated, is hope a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, the movie Shawshank Redemption lifts this up. Morgan Freeman, you remember, hope is a dangerous thing. Plato talked about hope. Plato agrees with Hesiod and Morgan Freeman when he said that hope is a passion for the uneducated in order that they may be exploited. It isn't actually until the Jewish people come along that they reinvent hope as a positive thing. You see, before that, the entire universe was this cyclical pattern of recurring bad things. Most other world religions see life as a cycle. But it was the Jewish people who came along, the Jewish theologians who said, no, 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 life is not one long cycle. Life has a beginning and an end. It's linear. There is a beginning to all things, and then there is an end to all things. And, and somewhere in the middle, Emmanuel, Emmanuel will come, God with us. And for us, that is Jesus Christ, that Jesus came in and broke into this, this life and brought hope. And so there is a focus, a destination, a promise that people of faith focus on. And that's what I want to think about today. Now, our text comes from the book of Hebrews, which, of course, is a Jewish community. We don't know when they lived, probably the second century. Uh, but we do know that they are lacking two things, faith and hope. And so the Apostle Paul, who may have written this text, writes to this group of people about faith and about hope. <clears throat> Let's listen for God's word. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. Listen for God's word. Paul begins, even though we speak like this, even though we have a lot of bad things happening, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. Notice this beginning point and an end point. We're focused on that thing. God is not unjust, says Paul. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but, but what Paul is saying here is that we actually have to participate in the own hope of our lives. That hope is a gift, as Luther would say, it's a gift of God, it is grace, but we get to participate in that hope. So keep doing the things that bring you hope. We're going to be talking about this throughout the series. You actually need a hope playlist in your life. It won't be good enough just to hear this sermon from me or the next sermon from Cynthia or the sermons after that. You need like 10 hopeful things a day, whether it's a phantom song or whether it's one of our worship songs, you need a playlist in your life. So Paul continues, we um, want to teach you and show you the diligence to the very end that it may be realized. Now, now let's focus on the next section here. We who have fled take hold of the hope set before us that we may be greatly encouraged. If I hadn't have skipped over a couple of verses, mostly because the basketball game is coming, I would have shared with you that the book of Hebrews is really about God's hope in people's lives again and again and again. So we just had that amazing song from our worship band, The God of Jacob. I love that song. The title of that song is Same God. We have the same God as Jacob. We have the same God as Sarah. We have the same God as Jesse. We have the same God as Mary. And I love those lyrics. You heard your children then. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You answered the prayers back then and you will answer the prayers now. You are the same God. You are providing things then and you have provided them now. You are the same God. That's really the, the primary argument from the book of Hebrews is that we worship that same God. And if God did those things back then, then God will do great things in the future. I love Maya Angelou, who said, you know, uh, when somebody does something or says something 
believe them the first time you see it. Jesus and God promised great things here. We can believe them. So one of the primary reasons we have hope is because we worship that same God. As God has done before, God will do again, no matter what's happening in our lives. But let's move to the central, central verse of the morning and put this in your playlist. Write it in your phones or go home. Remember, Hebrews 6, 19. This is the main verse of the morning. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul and a firm and secure dynamic. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Hope is an anchor for our lives. It's the anchor. One of my favorite preachers is Earl Palmer, who I believe is still alive. He lives up in Seattle. He used to be the pastor at First Press Berkeley, and he was a pastor in the 1980s. Has anyone, was anyone here in the 1980s? Anybody? Um, so anybody familiar with earthquakes? You do? You remember those? So Earl's ministry uh, was in the 80s, and uh, if you remember 1980, there was the Livermore earthquake. Put your hand in the air if you remember the Livermore earthquake. Very few people. That was only 6.2 Richter scale. Then in 1984 is the Morgan Hill earthquake. Anyone remember that? That was 6.4. A few of you do. Good. Um, Everyone remembers 1989. 7.1 Loma Prieta earthquake. You remember exactly where you were, right? So if you were in the Bay Area in the 80s, you know what was happening. All these earthquakes are happening, and none of the city officials know how to handle them. So the first time, they decide after the first earthquake, they said, well, let's try to build our buildings better. And so they had all these uh, restrictions on building. They made sure that people built their buildings out of good materials and such like that. But then the second earthquake came, and a lot of the buildings fell down. It wasn't good enough just to have a good structure built. They needed good foundations. So the city came forward, and they said, you're going to have to have solid foundations. No, you can't build on sand anymore. You can't build on mud anymore. You have to build on cement, and it has to be a solid block. So they did that, and then the 1989 earthquake came along, and buildings fell down. What they realized is that it really isn't building materials and foundation, it's the anchor. So they anchored, they made sure that any building built or any older structure has to be anchored to the foundation. And they did, and less buildings have fallen down. We haven't had a 7.1, God bless it, we pray we don't get another one. Hope is the anchor for our lives. Our lives are the houses. That's the structure. That's you right now. Your life is the house. The foundation is Jesus Christ. He's the rock upon which you can build your life. But hope is the anchor to that foundation. That's what keeps us standing and able to keep moving forward whatever is happening in our lives. So that's got to be in your playlist. The hope is the anchor of your life firm and secure. Now, I know the problem with talking about hope. I can read it on your faces. The problem is we live in a world where so many bad things happen. And so when I say, and when Paul says, well, God has done great things before, and God will do great things again, what you're telling me with your faces and what you're telling me with your bodies is that, wait, what about all the bad stuff? How are you sure that that won't get repeated too? I mean, let's just take this last week. This has been a crazy, terrible week. A lot of good things, but a lot of bad things. It began on Monday with a 16-year-old kid knocking on the wrong door in Kansas City. He plays saxophone with his band, and he is shot twice. And thank God he's still alive. That's Rolf Jarl. You can pray for him this week. And what what we might say is, well, if those kinds of things happen, how are you sure that they won't happen again? If that wasn't bad enough, in Dadeville, Alabama, there was a Sweet 16 birthday party where 32 kids were injured and four people killed. One of them a star athlete, the other the 
the uh, 16-year-old, the sweet 16-year-old in that party. Terrible, evil, dark. And so any logical person would say, well, if those things happen and they have happened before, how are you sure that those kinds of things won't happen again? And if that wasn't bad enough, a high school cheerleader in, in Texas opens the wrong car door and she is shot and she is killed, Heather Roth. Such dark things are happening in our world. So what's the answer? What, what would God say to this? I don't know what God would say, but as your pastor, I'd say, but we as a country have to do something about firearms. Now, I'm a hunter. I grew up in Utah and Idaho, uh, but we got to do something. I don't know what, but here's my theological answer. Hope is born in darkness. Hope is born in darkness. That's where hope begins to grow. And so the darker the moment in our lives, the darker the world is, that's where hope is born. Has anybody here been watching the, or gone out and seen this incredible super bloom that goes from Southern California through Arizona, through Texas? It's absolutely, insanely beautiful. This is my brother's family in Paso Robles. This is their Christmas picture. Uh, this is kind of funny. This is my niece, um, and she is diving into the flowers. Um, <laughs> it's like something out of Wizard of Oz. And I did fall asleep. They fell asleep right after this, just like Oz. But do you know how long those seeds have been in the ground? Eight years. Eight years in darkness, in mud, in dirt, no sunlight, very little water, eight years. Those tiny seeds have been in darkness and mud and dirt. But they came up. That's hope. My friends, you and me, you and I, we are those seeds. We are those seeds. And God's promise to you today is that those seeds will bloom again. They will bloom again no matter what you're dealing with. And the promise of the cross is that Jesus is the seed who went into a dark place on a Friday night and he came back to life again on a Sunday morning and he bloomed. My favorite image from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is when Aslan comes back to life again, the great lion representing God, Wherever he walks, there are flowers. Wherever God walks, there will be flowers in our life too. Why? Because we have the same God. Amen? God, thank you so much for your hope in our lives. Thank you that you bring seeds that are in darkness and in dirt back to life, and not just any life, but a huge, blooming, verdant, florid life. Thank you, Lord, that you are the same God of Jacob and Sarah and Rebecca and Abraham. And as you have done great things in the past, you will do great things to come. We lift up to you this broken world, Lord. We lift up to you the darkness of it. But we declare today, we declare today that we are going to be hopeful no matter what. Because our hope is our anchor in you, who is our foundation. In Jesus' name.